The topic for this study is entitled The Latter Rain and the Laodicean Message. The Bible teaching about the latter rain is based on the climate and geography of Palestine. Palestine is located at the east of the Mediterranean Sea and has what is known as a Mediterranean climate. The feature of this type of climate is that there is a hot, dry summer and a mild, wet winter. Rains come in the winter because the great westerly winds that circle the earth at that latitude blow over the Mediterranean Sea, picking up moisture in the winter months. And then they release that water when they reach the land over which they then blow. Crops such as wheat would be sown in the autumn when the first of the winter rains come, called the early rain. The crop would then be nourished throughout the winter by various showers that come from time to time. And then the last rains of the winter, called the latter rain, would bring the grain in the heads of the wheat to full size and then the dry, hot weather of the summer set in and the crop would dry out and would be harvested. From these observations, we can learn valuable spiritual lessons taught in Scripture when the early rain and the latter rain is applied to theology. For example, we have a chart on the screen that shows the natural world, the former rain in the beginning, showers during the season of the winter and latter rain at the end and then the harvest following when the crop dried out. We could also apply this to the history of the church, the one in the middle, the former rain being Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples. You read about that in the book of Acts. And then throughout history there have been times when there have been revivals in this Christian life for example, the Reformation times and other revivals, and then a latter rain coming at the end of the history of the world when the Holy Spirit will be poured out in mighty power to finish the work of God, which we will talk about in more detail in a little while. Down at the bottom, we have personal experience. The early rain experience, similar to what happens at conversion, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us and convicts us of sin and we are converted. And then as we live the Christian life, we have character growth. And down at the end, we have the latter rain, which is to do a work to prepare God's people for the end time crisis and for translation. In 1961, after five and a half years of mission work in India, I was traveling back to Melbourne in Australia by boat. When the ship reached Fremantle in Western Australia, a port near the city of Perth, two clergymen joined the ship. One was an Anglican priest, the other was a Roman Catholic priest. Both of these men were put on the ship by the Australian government, the Immigration Department, so that they were available for passengers to visit with them, discuss with them religious life in Australia as the boat travelled around the south coast of Australia from Perth to Melbourne and then on around to the east coast to Sydney. On the ship also at that port in Perth, Fremantle Harbour, a young Australian pastor of the Nazarene Church joined the ship to travel around to the eastern states. I made friends with this man during the voyage and had some discussions with him and he told me that on the first night when they went for the evening meal that he found himself seated at the table with these two priests that had been put on the ship by the Australian government 
And of course, they introduced themselves as you would expect them to do. When the Church of the Nazarene man was asked what he did for a living, he told them he was a pastor of the Church of the Nazarene, which was one of the religious denominations in Australia. When he uttered those words, one of the priests said to him, and what do you preach to your people, pray tell me? Without a moment's hesitation, the young church of the Nazarene replied, holiness of heart and life without which no man can see the Lord. The questioner replied, that sounds very profound. Of course, the young man was quoting Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, which says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man can see the Lord. The Bible tells us that we are to follow holiness and strive for holiness. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Ellen White, in the little devotional book, Sons and Daughters of God, page 198, said, Christ has given us no assurance that to attain to perfection of character is an easy matter. It is a conflict, a battle, and a march day by day. In many of her writings, she taught that the Christians were to attain perfection of character. I have read thousands of pages of her writings and repeatedly I have found her mention of the word perfection and almost always she qualifies it by saying perfection of character. She never taught that in this life we could attain perfection of nature or have, that is to have our carnal nature eradicated this side of the second coming. It is clearly taught in the Bible and in her writings that perfection of nature will be our experience when we are glorified at the second coming of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 57, and her book, Acts of the Apostles, page 560 to 562. Some Christians, it seems, are waiting for the latter rain to lift them up, give them the perfection of character that God desires them to have. Well, they may be well mistaken, for we are to strive for it now in our living day by day. Some have asked the question, well, what is perfection of character that God wants us to develop? The best answer that I can give to that question, which I have studied and meditated on for many years, is that perfection of character is the expression that designates the Christian development of character in his growth as a Christian to the point where he would rather die than knowingly or choose to do something that is wrong. I don't think God can ask more than that of us. After all, that is no doubt that the death test at the end of time, which we will talk about in a future lecture, is to demonstrate the fact that God's people in the last generation would rather die than choose to disobey God and commit a sin. <clears throat> In early writings, page 71, I read, those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. And then she goes on to say, I saw that many were neglecting the preparations so needful and looking to the time of refreshing and the latter rain to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a shelter. They had neglected the needful preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of a holy God. Those who refused to be hewed by the prophets and failed to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth 
and are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is, will come to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see that they needed to be hewed and squared for the building. But there will be no time then to do it and no mediator to plead their cause before the Father. Before this time, the awful solemn declaration has gone forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he that is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. These words mark the close of probation. And then she says, I saw that none could share the refreshing unless they obtained the victory over every besetment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. We should therefore be drawing nearer to the Lord and be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle of the day of the Lord. Let us remember that God is holy and none but holy beings can ever dwell in his presence. The message to the church of the Laodiceans has application for God's people in the last days. It tells us that we are neither hot nor cold, but that we are lukewarm. God is not pleased with his church during this state of its existence. We read in Revelation 3, 17 to 19, describing the Laodicean church, these words, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Ellen White wrote in the Testimonies to the Church, volume 2, page 36, and volume 3, page 2454, the gold advised to buy is faith and love. In Testimonies to the Church, volume 4, page 88, she says the white raiment representing the righteousness of Christ, which is to be ours by faith as we accept him. And then Testimonies to the Church, volume 3, page 254, that the Isav represents the Holy Spirit so needed by the Church in the last days. The latter rain is not given and will not be given to the Church to compensate for its lack of preparation. It will only be bestowed on those who have searched their heart and who have put away sin. This heart-searching will lead to a revival among God's people, whereas those who do not engage in this heart-searching will be shaken out. <clears throat> Preaching the lighter sin message will lead to genuine heart-searching and agonizing for victory in Christ over sin and temptation among those who are genuine. And this results in a revival for those who accept it and act on it, or it will cause those who reject it to be shaken out of the church. Ellen White expresses it this way in early writings, 270, 271. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless they were not resisting the darkness around them, and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left those and went to the aid of the earnest, praying ones. I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. 
This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and to pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. I saw that the testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded. <clears throat> the solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance on all who truly receive it. <clears throat> they will obey and thus be purified. Some years ago at 1962 General Conference session, Elder Bradford was preaching a sermon on the Holy Spirit. As most of you may know, he is an African-American preacher, and I tell you, these African-American preachers, they know how to preach. And in his sermon, talking about the Holy Spirit, he said these words, We ask God for the Holy Spirit. We pray for the Holy Spirit. We implore God to send his Holy Spirit. Then he paused leaned forward to the microphone and said, sometimes I think we are afraid we might get him. You see, in John 16, verse 8, Jesus said, when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will reprove the work, world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The first work the Holy Spirit does when he comes to the individual is to point out to him where he needs to reform, point out his sin. And let's face it, none of us like to be reproved in that way. I know from experience as a church pastor, when I have had to reprove some people for their wrongdoing, they almost never thank you. Sometimes they look at you with eyes that tell me they don't appreciate what I've just said. I've had them refuse to shake my hand at the church door after a sermon. Not that I attacked them personally in the sermon. I just made general statements about the need for reform and the need for right doing. And uh, the message went home to those that uh, were not living as they should have lived. And then they refused to shake my hand at the door. According to what we have just read, John 16, 8, the first work, as I said, of the Holy Spirit when he comes into our lives is to convict us of sin. And for many, that is not what we want. In fact, it could be an unpleasant experience, no doubt. But sometimes the surgeon has to hurt us somewhat in order to get us into good health. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Unless we are totally committed to Jesus and really want to overcome, we do not like to be told about our sins. How many of us say thank you when we are convicted of wrong? Unless we are prepared to put away sin in our lives, it is rather pointless praying for the Holy Spirit. In fact, it becomes a mockery to do so. And unfortunately, some people who'd love to have the Holy Spirit come, but they don't want him to do that first work on convicting them of their need. Now I want to talk for a while about those on whom the latter rain will fall. First of all, we're told it will only fall on born-again victorious Christians. You see, the coming of the Holy Spirit at conversion is like, as we saw before, is the early rain experience. The latter rain experience is to bring the harvest to preparation. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says that the Christian is to grow in grace. John 3, 5 says we are to be born again. That means that we must be converted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in the latter rain 
will not be poured out upon those who have not first of all received the early rain and been converted. <coughs> Galatians 5 and verse 25 says that we are to live and to walk in the Spirit. And Ellen White expressed it in this way in Testimonies to Ministers, page 506. The latter rain, ripening earth's harvest, represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. But unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life, the green blade will not spring up. Unless the early showers have done their work, the latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. Testimonies to Ministers 507. Many have in a great measure failed to receive the former rain. They have not obtained all the benefits that God has provided for them. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain when the richest abundance of grace shall be bestowed. They intend to open their hearts to receive it, but they make a terrible mistake. The work that God began in the human heart in giving his light and knowledge must be continually going forward. But there must be no neglect of the grace represented by the former rain. Only those who are living up to the light that they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. It may be falling on all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. How sad that would be. The following E.G. White statements add to the understanding as to onto whom the latter rain will fall. Early writing 71. I saw that none could share the refreshing unless they obtained the victory over every besetment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. Great Controversy 464, the latter rain will only fall on those who have experienced a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. Testimonies of the Church, volume 8, page 22. We are encouraged to pray for the Holy Spirit since God is willing to bestow it, to bestow him. Evangelism 6. Nine, nine, the Spirit will be poured out on those who are wholly consecrated to God. And page 670, 697 and 698, the Spirit will be poured out on a united church. There's something to meditate upon. A united church, the church needs to be united on its doctrine and on its mission in order to receive of the Holy Spirit in its latter rain power. In heavenly places, 338, the latter rain will never refresh the indolent or invigorate the indolent who do not use the powers that God has given them. The word indolent there means lazy. If we are lazy in our Christian life, we will not receive the benefits of the latter rain. Next question. When will the latter rain fall? Well, first of all, we are told that we are now living in the time of the latter rain. Early writings, uh, sorry, uh, testimonies to ministers first. 5.12, it is the time of the latter rain when the Lord will give largely of his spirit. So in these last days in which we are now living, it's the time of the latter rain. We can expect it to come as soon as the Lord is prepared to give it. Page 509 of the same volume. Let us with contrite hearts pray most earnestly that now, in the time of the latter rain, the showers of grace will fall upon us. We are told in Scripture, in Zechariah 10 verse 1, Ask ye of the Lord uh, rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. In the book Evangelism 701, Ellen White wrote, Let Christians ask in faith for the promised blessing, and it will come. 
The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the days of the apostles was the former reign. And glorious was the result. We read in the book of Acts that 3,000 people were converted in one day. Wonderful. Glorious was the result. But the latter rain, she says, will be more abundant. That tells me we are about to experience things in the growth of God's church in these last days that are more wonderful than what happened in the day of Pentecost. We need to be prepared for it and be ready for it. In the Review and Herald article, she wrote, March 22, 1887, when the way is prepared for the Spirit of God, the blessing will come. So the delay then of the latter rain falling is placed at our feet. We have to make the necessary preparation. <clears throat> Manuscript 4, she says, the latter rain will come as suddenly as did the midnight cry but with ten times the power. My, when I read that, I was uh, surprised. The latter rain is going to come with ten times the power of the midnight cry. The midnight cry refers to the experience after the first and second small disappointments when during the summer of 1844 in the Northern Hemisphere, Believing Christians believed the Lord was going to come on October 22. And about three months after they came to that realization, the message that Jesus was expected on October 22, 1844, went to almost every mission station around the world. And they didn't have radio and television and email and computer services in those days. They had slow-moving ships taking materials and pamphlets and literature around the world. But the message spread under the power of the Holy Spirit to almost every mission station in the world in three months. What a marvellous performance that was. But Ellen White tells us that the latter rain is going to come as suddenly as did the midnight cry, but with ten times the power. We are in for an exciting time. That quote, by the way, from Ellen White is found in the Spalding and Magnum collection of letters at page four. When the third angel's message is closing, that's when it's going to come. Early writings, 279. I was pointed down to the time when the third angel's message was closing. The power of God had rested upon his people. They had accomplished their work and were prepared for the trying hour before them. They had received the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and the testimony, the living testimony had been revived. The last great warning had sounded everywhere and it stirred up and enraged the inhabitants of the earth who would not receive it. Unfortunately, there will be some who will not receive it. Next point. She says, the latter rain will come during the little time of trouble just before the close of probation. Early writings, 85, 86. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plagues are poured out, that's after the close of probation, but to a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is still ministering in the sanctuary in heaven. At that time, while the work of the salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth and the nations will be angry yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, will come to give power to the loud cry of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. So they're given power through the latter rain to stand after the close of probation while the plagues are poured out. Then she tells us that there will be no specific time revealed as to when the latter rain will be poured out. Some have tried to tie it. Uh, some have tried to work out just when it will happen, such as linking it to the Sunday laws when they are passed and so on. But we have no inspired statement from her as to just when it will happen. In early writings, sorry, Ellen White in Selected Messages, Book 1, Page 192 said, I have no specific time of which to speak when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit 
will take place. Therefore, we must be prepared and open-minded so that when it comes, we will recognize it. But if we haven't done the work of preparation, as she has warned, there will be some that won't recognize it when it comes. And that would be a sad experience for them. Now, what is the work of the latter rain? First of all, it is to prepare the church and individuals for the second advent. For the second coming of Jesus. Galatians 4, verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth until Christ be formed in you. 1 John 3, 1 to 3 says, But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And Testimonies to Ministers, page 506, the latter rain ripening earth's harvest represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. And again on page 509, I read, As we seek God for the Holy Spirit, it will work in us meekness, humbleness of mind, a conscience dependence upon God for the perfecting latter rain. It will have a work to do to help perfect our characters. Secondly, it prepares the saints to stand in the last day trials. Early writings, 85, at that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud cry of the third angel and to prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues are poured out. Great Controversy 6.13, they, that is God's people, have received the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and they are prepared for the trying hour before them. Again, she wrote on the next page, in that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, because Jesus has closed probation and his priestly work has ceased. Note that all the saints will then be sealed. Further on page 622, she says, the time of trouble such as never was is soon to be upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess and which many are too indolent or lazy to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than it is in reality, but this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In that time of trial, every soul must stand for God himself before God himself. And then I follow another subheading. The latter rain will empower the church for witnessing. Early writings 33, at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were all filled with the Holy Spirit and we went forth proclaiming the Sabbath more fully. Then on page 85 she wrote, at that time the latter rain or refreshments from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud cry of the third angel. In the next presentation, you'll hear me develop that theme about proclaiming the Sabbath more fully expanded. Great Controversy 611, 612. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power, that means rare power, is here foretold. The message will be carried not so much by argument <coughs> as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented. The seed has been sown. Now it will spring up and bear fruit. And early writings 271, I heard those clothed with the armour speak forth the truth with great power. It had effect. Many had been bound, <coughs> some wives by their husbands and some children by their parents. The honest who had been prevented from hearing the truth now eagerly laid hold on it. All fear of relatives was gone. The truth alone was exalted to them. They had been hungering and thirsting for the truth. 
It was dearer and more precious than life. I asked what had made this great change. An angel answered, It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. What a thrill it would be to have a part in this closing work and to see Jesus coming for his people. We all need to pray most earnestly that God will keep us faithful so that none of us will be lost. May God bless you to that end is my prayer. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now, should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.